Thunder Rolling in the Mountains, Chapter 4 Fire burned in front of the council lodge. Our people were gathered around it, talking together. As we rode up, a deep silence fell upon the clan. Most of them would obey Joseph, their chieftain. All but the young warriors would follow him faithfully, no matter where he led them. He stayed on his horse. Listen to me with your hearts, he said to them, raising his voice against the wind. You have heard the sad news. You know we must leave our home. Some among us, the young warriors, will say to you, do not leave, do not flee like old women, fight. We shall live here in peace. Everyone moved closer to him. Now, he said, many soldiers camp on our lake, as many as we have warriors, and they all carry guns. At Fort Lapoy, hundreds of them wait. To the east and to the west, more soldiers are waiting, many more. To escape them would be dodging hail in a hailstorm. The people pressed closer to my father. They were terribly quiet. They felt the truth of his words like heavy stones falling upon them. From somewhere in the trees, Walidits called out, Sitting Bull, the great Sioux chieftain, did not run. He fought Custer. He killed all of his soldiers. But where is Sitting Bull now? Chief Joseph asked. There was no answer from Walidits. He's far away, said my father, hiding in Canada, the old lady's country. It would have been best had he stood and fought, said Two Moons. He stumped up and down, swinging his cudgel. There would be not be so many white soldiers, but there are too many white soldiers. So many, we must go, my father said. Alicot, my uncle, and the best of the warriors nodded. You speak the truth, he said. He picked up a cherry wood bow. This bow looks strong, he said, but it cannot stand against someone stronger. With a quick movement of his massive hands, he snapped the bow in two. My father held up his hand. In ten sons, we leave Willowa. Make bundles of all you have. We will not return, not for a long time. What you leave behind, white scavengers will steal. My mother looked sad. In a few weeks, she would have a child. She wanted her child to be born in our land of wandering waters. Many times she had said this. At my father's words, she sighed once, a deep sigh, but she made no protest. The people waited for my father to say more. When he was silent, they wandered off to the lodge. I heard no cries and no weeping. They had swallowed their tears. A moon came up and the wind faded away. It was a time for love songs, but there were no sweet songs, only the beat of drums. Before I went to bed, I talked to Swan Necklace. The redcoats had gone, and he was guarding their horses in front of his father's lodge. You've heard it, Chief Joseph, speak, I said. Where do you stand? I go with red moccasin tops and walletits, he said bravely. You guard their horses, but where are your weapons? It is important to guard their horses, and I have a knife. But you do not carry it. It's hidden in the lodge. Why is it not in your belt? I forgot to put it in my belt. It's dangerous to ride around without a weapon. You're no longer a painter of pictures. You're a fighter against those who want to kill you. I don't feel like a fighter. You will when someone shoots at you. Do you believe that the great chieftain high above will protect me when someone shoots? You must think so, then you'll be brave. He got up and put his paints away. He was painting a blanket for our wedding. Everything had been done for our wedding, or almost everything. First two moons and his wives had come to talk to my father and mother. They brought many presents, horses, blankets, wooden spoons, and an iron kettle. They asked Chief Joseph in springtime whether I wished to marry their son. My mother came outside where I was hiding, listening under a bush, and asked me if I wanted to marry Swan Necklace. Yes, I said. Do you love him? Since longer than I can remember, I said. There was more to do before the wedding could take place. Chief Joseph and Springtime had to give presents to Two Moons and his wives, and Swan Necklace had to finish my buffalo blanket. I asked Swan Necklace about the blanket. I talked to my father last night. He was angry that I even thought about a wedding. He said that there was a war to be fought. He said young husbands make poor warriors. That means we can't be married until the war is over. Not until the one-armed general and his soldiers are driven from Willowa, my father said. Wait, I said. I went to the lodge and brought back my rifle and a pouch of bullets. Swan Necklace stared at the rifle as if it were a snake. I don't know how to shoot, he said. 
Red moccasin tops will teach you, I said. He will show you how to lie flat on the ground behind a rock, how to lie flat and shoot and push the rock ahead of you, how to ride low to one side of your horse so you can't be seen by your enemy and shoot under the horse's neck. The booming voice of two moons called his name. Before he could move, I put the rifle in his hands and slung the pouch of bullets over his shoulder.